Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Jared McGinnis. Uh, we're going to be talking to uh, Caleb Azuma Nelson about his new book. Um, just, yeah, it's just kind of nice to be convivial again. So it's just really nice, and, and books are that thing that do that so well. Um, and this is, we, um, we're both kind of debut authors, and we're just kind of chatting about the kind of oddness, because one of the things about you know books is about kind of reaching out to others and really kind of in visiting worlds that you can no longer visit, and that just feels so much more prescient uh, um, this year and last. And you know, it's just we're starting to be a little bit more comfortable with each other. Um, but so let's get started. Let's talk about let's talk about this guy here. Uh, Caleb Zuma Nelson is a British Ghanaian writer and a photographer living in Southeast London. Uh, he's just moved in with his partner. If we want to talk about that, we can, or we keep it professional. You know, I'm fine. Uh, his writing has been published with Litro, who are amazing. He was recently shortlisted for the Palm Photo Prize and the BBC National Short Story Prize in 2020. And he's also won the People's Choice Prize. Um, his debut novel, Open Water, is a love story about finding the right person at the wrong time between two, two artists in South London. Um, what were these? People who seem destined together can be torn apart uh, by fear and violence. And over the course of a year, they find their relationship tested by forces beyond their control. Um, so I, I suppose we can kind of, I'm always kind of interested, like, why did you need to write this book? Um, I think when, when I started writing this book, it wasn't fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I met with my now literary agent, uh -huh. and I'd sent her this collection of essays that were looking at all of the strands that run through the book. That's interesting. So we're looking at these ideas of photography and the way that we see each other and the way mm -hmm. that we express the emotions that we feel towards each other and mm -hmm. what happens when there's a breakdown in that expression and a breakdown in that communication. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I was also writing a lot about music. And, yeah. You know, there's a lot of music that runs through yep. the book. Um, but mostly I was writing about love and, and what it could mean to love someone, but also something too. Yeah, I, I, so I have to say, I've just kind of, I was kind of parachuted in to, to um, do this, this interview, and so I've been kind of reading it furiously. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in my 40s, I've been with my partner for 20 years. And so I'm very kind of secure in our relationship. And what I found amazing about Open Water was it did bring me back to those moments of before that and the kind of insecurity of new love. Mm -hmm. and I think that's captured really well. And also the kind of the, the, the English tradition of not being able, the British tradition of someone not being able to express mm -hmm. what, they, what they feel. Mm -hmm. And could you maybe talk a little bit more about these, these two characters and yeah, what is the, you know, what are the impediments there? For sure. I think the, so, you know, right at the beginning of the novel, a man and a woman meet in a bar in Southeast London mm -hmm. and have this very immediate connection yeah. with each other. The man is a photographer and the woman is a dancer. So they're both artists and they're, and so both of them are constantly trying to take something that's part of their interior is, is yeah. like very much inside them and express it. So, it, so it was important that these two, these two characters were artists. For sure. Kind of because, yeah, yeah, because I think there was, there was a tension that I was trying to explore there whereby people who are used to trying to express something cannot. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, and I was really intrigued with, I don't know, that first and foremost, that kind of like, that meeting someone and there being a world of possibilities mm -hmm. when you do meet someone, yeah. anyone new, and what happens when you begin to explore yeah. that world of possibilities, what happens when you essentially create a small world for each other where you can exist and kind of have this freedom. Mm -hmm. I think so much of the book is both of them separately trying to find freedom together. And, and I mean, there's a lot of self-denial. Mm -hmm. And, and in a lot of ways, in a different ways, and then like, was that kind of a deliberate thing? And is, are you trying to say something more beyond uh, just the relationship themselves? Because they kind of both deny the relationship even, so. I don't know, I think so. I think they both deny the relationship, but mostly because they don't know how to put a label on the relationship. They don't know how to say that this is what I'm feeling, or perhaps that there's a fear about saying, mm. this is exactly what I'm feeling. But yeah, yeah, yeah. like, 
you know, being vulnerable is really difficult. It's really hard to, to be vulnerable and also to continue to be vulnerable, to yeah. be able to be in a space with someone and to, to say, like, you know, I trust you with, with this, which is me in my like, yeah, most, absolutely. like, whole and raw state. It's kind of made very explicit uh, by the, the girl, right, when she says you could kill me in my sleep. Yeah, which and is, like, <laughs> I've, like, I've never really thought of that. Like, yeah. that you could, you know, when you are lying next to someone at night, you are trusting them with your life. Yeah. Um, and I think I really wanted to like hone in on these very small moments that yeah. make up our lives where, you know, you get in a car with a parent and you are trusting them to get you from A to B. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, someone cooks for you and you are trusting them to just like, to feed you and to care for you. Yeah, like these, yeah. these are things that are happening every day. And I, I guess the photography in me just wanted to like hone in on these like snapshots, yeah. these moments that are occurring all the time. I, I definitely would like to get into more about kind of how the photography um, plays with the writing. But you also do something kind of in terms of the text that is interesting and kind of hard to maintain, which is using the second person. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you could talk about that and also kind of talk about, because that you is very slippy, right? That's, mm -hmm. That you can re be referring to any number of people. And I think you do occasionally slip into the first person. I think there is moments there, but maybe, no, it's, it's just- It's complete, always like- It's always in you. Yeah. yeah. And if, for me, like I wanted, I actually wanted to have that feeling where it was like, where it felt that we were moving through different sort of persons or different tenses. And, yeah. um, but first and foremost, I wanted the reader to have this very intimate thing come towards them. Like I, you know, when you're reading, when you're reading the book and you're asking questions in the text, like yeah. you are literally asking yourself yeah. the question when right. you, as a reader. Um, and so I wanted it not so much to be, here is a book, here is a narrative, but more so, here is a conversation yeah. that you and I are having as reader and writer. And so that was that you was kind of the directly addressing the, the you as the reader. Because sometimes it also felt like uh, the you was kind of, you know, the, the narrator was kind of referring to himself mm -hmm. and the you. Mm -hmm. But also it felt there was, a, there was occasion where the you became ex ex inclusive to being a black man. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if that was a kind of me reading extra into it or this is something that you thought about. Because it does, it, it, it is a theme within the work. Yeah, for yeah. sure. You know, I guess the, the work like comes from my lens, like it's not necessarily autobiographical, but it's very personal. Yeah, like yeah. so much of my writing process was, you know, this question is peppered throughout the text of asking how do you feel? Yeah, and yeah, I would yeah. start from there and I would create these fictional events from feelings that I knew and that I'd experienced. Oh, that's really interesting. So that was part of the kind of, that was part of the creative process for you, is that this is how you kind of evolved the book yourself, is actually having, so you, it's gonna get tricky here, the you of the reader was you yourself, the author, so it was, you were playing both roles at the same time, and that's, okay, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. really, yeah, because so, you do have this natural kind of conversation going on. But yeah, yeah. That, like the conversation, I think, is, is the most important thing, because so much of the, so I like I grew up as a big reader and always yeah. would have books in my hand. But so much of the storytelling that I experienced growing up was was this oral tradition that yeah. you know, like I have a big family. My mum is one of ten and my dad is one of nine. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And so you'd be sitting at a dinner table and people would be like fighting for space to tell yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah. But then you know the the whole floor would quieten and one person would be talking oh, and they wow. would just like go and go and like like tales would wind yeah, and meander, yeah, yeah. but then you'd eventually get to the point and it felt more like a, even though that's like a kind of someone talking at you, it's not really, it's like you, you're being brought into the conversation. Yeah, so I mean, was he, were these like, were these like family stories or like what happened to me that day? And it, it was kind of- anything. And it'd be and anything. You, and you always knew there were certain family members who were just like- Yeah, like, absolutely. Just go off and like half an hour later, you're sitting there like exactly. listening to yeah, the same yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Like, where's the punchline coming? Uh, I mean, so I come from a big family of storytellers as well. Yeah. And there's, yeah, I, I completely recognize that. And there are, yeah, there are certain characters that, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, Aunt Marilyn's getting started. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, so as that is, that is that what is that what came first? Was was storytelling come first, came first or kind of the visual element? Because you're a photographer as well. Yeah. Like, which, which came first for you as kind of a medium? I think, I think storytelling yeah. first. Like I, I have very early memories of trying to write stories, yeah, like yeah, yeah. being five or six years yeah. old and trying to uh, like have no, no idea how to form a story yeah, in a sense, yeah. but trying to say, 
this is what I can see or this is what I can hear. And, yeah. and as I grew older, like I picked up a camera first when I was 16 or 17. Uh -huh. My uncle left me his film camera when he passed, like, right. like an old 35 millimeter film camera. Um, and I just picked it up and I started shooting. And it was mostly like, I was just really intrigued with the world yeah. around me, but I yeah. was always attracted to people and yeah, yeah. what their stories were. Yeah. And then, and so did you did you express any interest in photography before your uncle passed? Like, why did he choose to hand the uh, the camera down to you? That's that's something there's something about that. He's yeah. saying something, I think. Yeah, I think the there's some really um, shaky footage I found about a year ago. Mm. The the last time I went to Ghana, which was like almost 15 years ago, um, and I asked my mum who had who had taken this, and she was yeah. like, "It was you." And I, I don't remember it. Like really it yeah, so like I feel like I've always had that pull. So he, he, he saw something yeah, and yeah. kind of pushed that forward. That's incredible. Yeah. Was it an old kind of like manual camera so you had to learn all old, your... Old like kind of, yeah. So, and I still shoot on film now yeah. just because I like really appreciate the, the sort of texture that's captured. Absolutely, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. The kind of tactileness because that's it. In a kind of increase, and my notes are on this. <laughs> I'm not watching Netflix. Um, <laughs> Yeah, kind of. I mean, talk, I mean, that's an interesting thing. You kind of talk about that kind of the kind of physicality of that because we are even now we write books in a very kind of digital. Did, I mean, or did you handwrite this? As like, there, there were parts that were handwritten yeah. and that came out really quickly, but also quite slowly. So yeah. it was like you know, I would something would come to me and I'd be like, oh, just like sit with this. Yeah. And an hour later, I would find there was a chapter that yeah, had, yeah, yeah. that had emerged. Um, but there's a chapter towards the end that I actually wrote first. Um, oh, interesting. And came out just like in its entirety by hand and really no changes from yeah. like what came out. And that's, yeah. that's when you know like the muse is on your yeah. shoulder. It's, yeah. yeah that's, that's inevitable. You bang your head for hours and hours, but all of a sudden it just kind of comes. It comes, yeah. The time disappears and you've... That, you've that's what it is, yeah. right? And I think that's why, that's why I think I still shoot on film like I, w I wish I brought my camera with me I shoot this like on this big medium format yeah all oh, right trip. incredible um, yeah yeah and so it's always it's usually in my bag but the, the trip from well it would have been it would have been he lost his bags uh, on the way here on so, the train right, here yeah, so, <laughs> so we basically just both arrived and yeah. please cross your fingers mate. <laughs> yeah exactly so if he gets any phone calls from uh, Scott <laughs> Rail, we'll have to pause for a moment um, um, but yeah it's, it really slows me down I think like being able to I don't know about you, but so much of the power in the work for me comes from staying present yeah, and, yeah. and like having a notebook beside me or yeah, using yeah, this yeah. camera that is completely manual and I can't rely on anything else but myself yeah, yeah, encourages yeah. me to really stay in the moment and ask like, what is happening? Uh, absolutely. I, 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 that's definitely something that I see in my own work is of, or the process of the work is what I enjoy most is when the time disappears and that kind of, yeah, because we spend so much of our time not in the present and kind of worrying about, you know, this and that and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and how, so, I mean, I was kind of avoiding this, but let's, let's get into it. It's like how I wanted to really kind of get into the, to the kind of differences for you in terms of, because photography, as you say, is, is, it's, it's, it's a much more physical experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't know. Is it is it the same medit Is it is it the same process, or is it less kind of cognitive? Are you kind of really going much more on instinct? Mm -hmm. Then could you talk about the differences in terms of your processes and if they feed each other or yeah. detract from each other? I'd be yeah. interested to hear about that. I always I always thought of photography previously as over here and writing yeah. over here and open water really brought those two things together for me. Like so much of so much of my writing process emerges from like having these almost like these like imaginary snapshots mm -hmm. whereby like you know at the beginning of the novel the uh the pair are at a party mm -hmm. in a bar yeah. like dark room and and that's what i can see yeah and so i then spend time with that with that image like yeah. in my mind and and i try to transcribe what the possibilities of that moment are yeah. Like, what could happen from here? What yeah. do I want to happen? Where are the characters sort of leading me towards? But it's always something that I can see. And so it feels very, it feels a little bit more immediate to me because I mm. think photography is such a visceral 
medium. Like you see a photograph and there is like quite an immediate reaction and usually it's like, it's quite a sure yeah. reaction, right? Like when you see something, you're like that, I know what I am seeing. And for me, I'm like, right. what's underneath what I'm seeing. That's, that's in the, in, the, in photography, you want to see what's just beyond the kind of like, you know, the kind of, you know, um, you know, Probably. enumerating of what's in yeah. the photo. Yeah. It's about there's something more there. Yeah. And then, yeah, and that's great. Yeah. That's and so I'm, I'm always, because language really has its limitations, mm. and I'm always trying to bend language towards, towards emotion. Like I'm trying to close mm. that gap between emotion and expression. It's, it's a relatively, it's, it is a lyrical style, but it is relatively unadorned. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, when you kind of talk about it, I feel that really kind of comes out, is that that is what you really are. It's almost kind of the documentation of, of you're not kind of distracting us with, with language mm -hmm. so much as kind of like, yeah, this kind of, I was here at this moment, and yeah. these things happened. Yeah. And it has a real nice effect. And actually, and there's a real kind of, there's also a rhythm to it as well. So I was wondering, maybe, shall, shall we give a reading just to give a yeah. flavor of this so you can yeah, for sure. see what I'm gushing about? Um. Let's see. All right. I'm going to read a section, which is actually more, yeah, it's sort of in the middle about getting a haircut. <laughs> a haircut is an undertaking. You think of the waiting, waiting for your hairline to breach the line your barber had placed on your forehead a few weeks before. You think of the decision to go, a gamble in itself. Your barber, like most barbers, doesn't have a schedule. Today, as you enter, you're early. Early is always better. There's a child in the seat, bawling as the barber takes a metal toothed comb to hair which has curled and twisted. Roots and undergrowth merge together to form a home. And your barber joins... Oh. Roots and undergrowth merge together to form a dense, kinky bush on his head. His mother watches on as the barber attempts to tease the comb through hair which won't reciprocate the effort. Leon, your barber, doesn't give up. He oils that hair with his own hands, so it's a smooth journey for the comb, rather than the scratches like twigs snapping. He takes care, and the child calms, comforted by the endeavor and the barber's instructions for kink prevention. It's not long before the barber gives you a nod in your direction to say it's your turn. You sit in the chair, letting him drape the apron over you, which he cinches at the neck. He takes a set of clippers in hand. The buzz of the machine operates at a vibration that speaks to you and encourages you to do the same. What do you want? He asks. Skin fade, you say. Keep the top, please. The beard? You can shave it off. The barber works quietly, murmuring to himself. You close your eyes and allow yourself to drift away. You're safe here. You're able to say what you want and know it's okay. You know you, there is a semblance of control that you don't often have. You know you can be free here. Where else can you guarantee black people gather? This is ritual, shrine, ecstatic recital. With every visit, you are declaring that you love yourself. You love yourself enough to take care. And it's here in the barbershop that you can be loud and wrong and right and quiet. And it's here you can lean across to the next man and state your case, ask for clarification, inquire into that which you don't know. It's here you can laugh. It's here you can be serious. It's here you can breathe. It's here you can be free, especially with the barber. What you say to him stays. How you been? He asks. Can't complain, can't complain. You? Just came back from holiday. I was in Ghana. How was it? My body is back, but my mind is still there. It's a special place. You've been? A while ago. That's where my family is from. That makes sense. You've got that energy, that rhythm. Everyone is so calm there. They take their time. They eat. They drink. They laugh. They live well. 
And I'll tell you something else, he says, tapping your shoulder. You don't have to worry about looking like us when you're out there. I hear that, he says. That kind of freedom? He shakes his head and continues to work the clippers over your scalp. It's just different. He starts up a few moments later. The sun shines, the climate, it makes me want to do things, to be out in the world. When I'm here, winter comes and I hibernate. You both laugh. It wasn't meant to be here, you know. I've been in this country years and years before you were born. Came here, had my children, my children are having children. And still, it doesn't feel like home. It doesn't feel like I'm wanted here. Hmm? What is it you do for work? I'm a photographer. See, you don't have to be here. You have another half? You pull your phone from your pocket and flash the photo of her on your home screen. She's beautiful. What my advice? Find a place you can call home. This isn't it. It's hard to just be in this place. So much goes on that you don't even realize until you realize and you know what I mean? Go somewhere you can be free where you don't have to think too tough about what you want to do before you do it. Find a place you can call home. He taps your shoulder once more. You're all done, young man. Outside, you stand and brush the tiny flecks of dark hair from the back of your neck. A light breeze grazes your freshly shorn head. You begin to untangle your headphones for your walk home, and your barber joins you on the stoop of his shop. He hums, watching traffic pass on this main road. From his pocket, he pulls a bag of tobacco, some rolling papers. He opens the tiny bag and there's a smell of something sweeter, something darker, heavy like musk, but light as cloud. You watch as he pinches the tip of the paper and tucking the bag between his stomach and arm lines the joint with a healthy serving. He rolls it back and forth and lifts it to his mouth to seal, humming all the while. The song is a loop, a light number which dances up and down the scales. This is ritual, you think, as he twists the end and pulls out a lighter. The joint sparks a light on the first try and your barber pulls smoke into his lungs. He nudges you, arm outstretched, the joint an offering at the shrine. You take it from him and inhale as deep as it will go. You feel your brain go hazy and dark immediately. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I thought it was great to kind of, again, capture what we've been talking about, these kind of just quiet moments between, between people and, and, and um, just in kind of the beauty and its simplicity of that, mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, as you say, in, in the moment. Um, there's also there's also some greater things going on, and in particular, I thought we kind of talk about the there's a lot of repetition in terms of theme mm -hmm. and time is a particular you know there's kind of it's always kind of marked certainly with the relationship between um, the man and the woman, mm -hmm. um, but there's a repetition of phrases mm -hmm. and even kind of uh, kind of a liturgical repetition of art made by black artists. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if you can kind of talk about what you were what you were trying to do there. And yeah, for sure. I think. There were two things at play. In terms of, in terms of the repetition, yeah. um, I've always been really intrigued in, in repetition. I think it comes from my background in music. I played the violin for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. also like, just grew up listening to jazz yeah. um, and a lot of hip hop. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's all repetition. Like, yeah. you, know, you listen to like Miles Davis or John Coltrane and yeah. the like the jazz standard, the, the three or four bars, they don't change. Yeah. But the, who, whichever musician is leading the solo will wind yeah. and dance and dart after different notes. And yeah. that for me is just, is really incredible that you could, that you could use repetition to like form this quite fertile ground from which yeah. possibilities might spring out of. Yeah. Um, and so, and also I guess with repetition, when you're, if you repeat, repeat a phrase, the, like it's never the same, right? The, 
both the reader and the narrative have changed yeah. from the, from like page one to page ten. Yeah, absolutely. And so something has, has moved, something has shifted. That yeah. phrase takes on a different meaning. And I was so intrigued in and you can, yeah, and you can pull the weight of when that first, when that phrase, because there's a particular phrase that I think is, is his grandma talks about the kind of seed in the ground that mm -hmm. becomes this beautiful kind of reoccurring metaphor for their relationship that, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, you're, by doing that repetition again, you're kind of, you're creating resonation, you know, resonances mm -hmm. from the kind of earlier and kind of bringing it along. And it's yeah. kind of like a, it's kind of um, kind of and I think with regards to the art, like I, something that I mentioned earlier, about language having its limitations. Like I was, I knew that this feeling that I was trying to describe in particular, like this idea of love or love that you're trying to express to someone that, that often just escapes our grasp. Mm. Um, I wondered whether if I could employ the, the sort of these other art forms that I engage with and that I really love. Yeah. Um, and whether they could kind of like bridge that gap for me. Yeah. So like, you know, it's difficult to say, to, to like explain what it means to really love your partner specifically. Yeah. But I could say to you, here is this film, here is Moonlight, or yeah, yeah, here yeah, is yeah. this song that, that, might just, that might get a bit closer to that. Yeah, and so yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted the reader to kind of take on this same journey of just trying to figure out what they were feeling with me. In, in, in an ideal world when, where you could afford all the licensing, I mean, would you see a version in which, like, you know, the reader themselves is kind of listening and kind of seeing, like, you, you, you're referring to Moonlight, mm -hmm. and in Cotton talk about, again, that was one of my, a part that I quite enjoyed, because here was a photog photographer talking about the, um, the color palette of the film. And it's a film I saw, a film I loved, mm -hmm. and... It was at that moment, it was like, oh yeah, it really did have a very specific color palette, especially for the different parts of the film, he used very different palettes, yeah. and kind of, again, expressing emotion through a visual medium. So just wondering, like, did you, you know, did you ever think about having photography, or again, like, if it was possible, would you want the reader to kind of be listening to this music at, like, you know, the bits and the songs that, you know, because they, you know, it's constantly referenced, and they have experiences together about mm -hmm. songs. Uh, you know, they're at, they're at like clubs and stuff like that. Yeah. So just wondering. I think with the so with the songs, we partnered with Spotify to put mm. together a playlist yeah. that sort of like a lot of people have told me that they have read the book with the playlist going in the background, which is like even I didn't do that. So yeah. like it, yeah, I can't yeah, like yeah. yeah, it must be like a very like like more like lifted experience doing that. Um, but with the visuals, like I really wanted it. I really wanted it to be something in the way that like, you know, to say to someone, like, close your eyes. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. this is what I can see. Like this is what like I'm describing to you like what it's I a might very see deliberate. Like, yeah, yeah. And I want you to I don't want and I don't want an exactness. Like I, I don't want like I write with precision, but I didn't want precision in those moments. Like I wanted it to be like, what are you bringing to this? What are you hearing from what I'm describing that I could see? And I, I, think that's, I think that's where language, as you say, it has its limitations, but those limitations are in its power in the terms of, like, when we describe a red house, mm -hmm. you know, we have all have an image now in our heads. And as an author, for me personally, like, I'm, I'm very interested in how I can... It's, the, the form is unique in that the reader has to do as much work as I did. Well, not as much, trust me, it takes, these things take forever. But like to engage with the form, the reader has to pay attention. When the reader stops paying attention, the, the art stops. Whereas if you watch a film and your mind is drifted off, the film continues. And it's kind of very kind of unique in that is because as you say, you can trigger their own memories. And if you're doing it well, you can kind of, you can shape that and, and feed it. And I think it is limited, but I think in that, that's where its strength is. Because when you see a photograph, you kind of are kind of forced there. And the, I think the interaction is different, I think, yeah. in terms of, um, I had a friend who's a photographer I was telling you about, and I was kind of complaining about like, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work to, to, you know, understand a piece of literature. You have to actually read it. And he's like, that's great because I work in a visual medium and uh, all you have to be is a Russian oligarch and you buy the painting off the wall and somehow you understand that, that, that art more than, than anyone else. There's something about that. Mm -hmm. And it's something interesting in that form because you can kind of bollocks the understanding of, of visual art because it's not based on language, whereas again, to access um, 
literature, you do really have to engage with it and work yeah. on it. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, that's really interesting that that was kind of deliberate. One of the main characters of the book, I would argue, is London itself. Mm. Um, and I've just recently moved from London, so there was quite a bit of nostalgia for me of like, you know, you talk about kind of moving from places. And sometimes London is, is threatening. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of very small world of the you that exists. And then there's kind of the, the wider London. So I wonder if you could talk about your relationship with London and how you feel about London. If yeah. it's, it's the same as a character or you deliberately kind of only showed one aspect of London to, for the narrative. I guess this, you know, it, the book feels like a love letter to so many different things, but South East London specifically, mm -hmm. where I grew up and I've always just been so intrigued with because of the, the number of people who have come from elsewhere to make a home in the UK and in London specifically. Mm. Um, I think that so much of so much of my experience in South East London has been about the community. It's mm. about the people. It feels like a real family there. There are people mm -hmm. that there that I've known for years and years and only in passing. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but I would still say that I, I know these people. Um, and yeah. so I was really trying to, to capture that element of like, mm -hmm. you know, that it's not, London is often very chaotic and yeah. very busy and is seen as like this big, like monolith, like this big yeah, city. Yeah. And like, I really wanted to hone in on this specific, this like quite small part, this specific part that- Yeah, it was, like, a, it, was it felt like a village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. For most, And London does. Yeah, okay. like, yeah. And I think that there were so many of us in like our various places in the worlds that we live in that are like, this is, it could be London, it could be Bristol, it could be Wigtown, like it, this is where the world begins and ends for yeah, us. Yeah, and yeah. like we leave and we come back. And yeah. for me, that's Southeast London. Like yeah. it's, it's tidy, but it is like its own sort of like place in itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, and, it, but also it kind of also felt like London was a symbol for the outsideness and mm -hmm. certainly, there's a kind of reoccurring theme again about kind of the kind of inherent violence mm -hmm. that's that's there, and you have this. I was just wondering if you could kind of talk about the kind of that juxtaposition between basically what is a love story, mm -hmm. um, and then this other theme of you know what it is to love in an environment like this. Mm, for sure, like I think I was I was thinking about the tension that exists between like your public and your private spheres. Mm -hmm. um, and wondering what happens when you like, you hone in on these like private spaces where, you know, this couple are spending time together and they're spending time really not doing anything, but mm -hmm. listening to music and eating and drinking and like watching films and going to shows. And, but they always know that when they're with each other, this like this small sort of like private world has been created. Yeah. But then outside of that lurks a threat and it's always lurking it's never like directly mm -hmm. in their faces but there's always its presence is always yeah. felt um and i yeah i really wanted to to kind of like look at what happens when you have to even when you've created these private spaces for yourself like no matter who you are you create these spaces for yourself where you're like i am comfortable like i yeah. experience a freedom here yeah. and what happens when that's interrupted and, it's, and that's it, it does get interrupted and then it, it, it's an intrusion into the relationship and it's kind of felt, you know, again, this is, this is an individual who can't express himself, you know, even though he, you know, makes a living at expressing mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of a communication breakdown mm -hmm. um, because of this, these other, other traumas. I mean, they're basically traumas. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just, and I mean, I suppose what I'm getting at is, is uh, what am I getting at? It's... Uh, how, how, I mean, it's, for me, it was what the sadness of this was, was in when they were in the self and then we're to this kind of together in the private space, mm -hmm. um, it was them and beautiful. And then the outer world came and mm -hmm. his inability to kind of process kind of, you know, one being kind of perceived and there was a, there's a great line where you talk about being seen and the difference between being looked at and being seen. Exactly. Yeah. And so his struggle is being looked at, mm -hmm. you know, and seeing as he's perceived as a threat because he's a black man. Mm -hmm. 
And interesting, like, and there's that moment where they're in bed together and she's a female and inherently a male body is a threat. And it's kind of really interesting of how we kind of played that. And he doesn't, doesn't process it well. No, uh -huh. no, not at all. And I think, I think the, this like sort of, this private versus public space mm -hmm. means that when you enter a public space, you often have a guard up you often are trying to trying to prevent yourself from being looked at. Mm. You would pref you would rather not be you'd rather hide. You'd rather not be looked at than mm. not be seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that the characters, the male character's struggle is that he doesn't know where to switch that off. Mm. Um, and in not switching that off, there's no understanding of the f the woman's struggle as well. Yeah. Um, because we all like we all have this version of ourselves that we want to be seen as. Like we want to be seen as like whole and yeah. full. And there are always occasions, small and big in our everyday yeah, yeah, that yeah. prevent that from happening. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, yeah. You yeah. go through your life being you until somebody comes and say you're so, this. And yeah. you're like, ah, oh, now I have to stop being me and deal with you perceiving me as, as this. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's exhausting. Yeah, uh, and, it's, and for, for him, it feels constant. But he hasn't tapped in to the fact that for her it's also constant yeah um and there's that's where the breakdown is because she keeps being like i'm in this with you like yeah. we're like like i've got you but you need to have me as well yeah and yeah they're sort of like there's a tension there where where he then can't he can't turn off that guard he can't turn off that shield yeah. and he sees perce essentially perceives her as a threat too yeah yeah and that's why it's so great and heartbreaking. <laughs> you really feel for the, these these young people who, ha you know, it's hard enough to be young. But again, it's that it's as you say, you've kind of pulled into that that universal feeling of that, yeah, that you are yourself until it's kind of pulled away from that. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't navigate it very well. And it's, uh, I mean, that therein lies a kind of sadness and mm -hmm. the beauty of, of of the work. So it's really good. So uh, we both have books out uh, during a pandemic. Yes. How's that been for you? It's interesting. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is such a social thing. Like you, you're, you're kind of in your, you know, darkened garret, uh, scribbling away on, you know, bits of paper towel um, and all this kind of thing. And then you finally have a book out in which you kind of, you know, you, you, the chance of what we're doing here is kind of talking about it and kind of celebrating that this thing exists because it's, it's, there's a thousand reasons not to write and there's a thousand reasons not to finish the book. And, and you did. And, You've done a great one. So could you kind of talk about your experiences having a book out? And if it's been positive, it's been negative, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are the things you've kind of enjoyed? It's been, it's just been a whole lot. It's been really, it's been really special. I think it was very clear to me, maybe in November, that the book was, that the book would come out and it would be in a lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew I wouldn't be inside a bookshop, but at every juncture, like, people have celebrated the work and have like made efforts to kind of bridge mm -hmm. that gap. But for me, it's, I mean, I haven't put out another book, so it's all I know. Yeah, for me, it's yeah, been yeah. great. Like I've really, <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. It's like, this is really wonderful. I've got a book out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's, I mean, nothing takes away from like kind of going past the bookshop and seeing your book uh, inside yeah. or in the window. It's a thing, um, man. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. it's really cool, right? Um, a few months ago, I was on my walk in the morning on a Sunday and I passed a Cafe Nero and this dude had open water like kind of nose to the page yeah, like, yeah, really, yeah, like, yeah. kind of like really into it and I walked in and I was like you're reading my book and he was he was like oh like he thought I said you're reading a book I'm reading yeah, and yeah, yeah. so he was like how did you find it and I was like no 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 I wrote the book yeah. and he just like lost his mind it was like a really was it great like, was it good moment. Yeah, he yeah, was, was excited really about it yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Um, did you sign it for him? I did, yeah, yeah I did. Cool. Yeah, so stuff like that is, is really special. And I think, like you're saying, like the ability to, to be in rooms and to be amongst like communities and other people is really where the, um, is really like what's been great about this. Yeah. Like, I think even when we haven't been able to do this, to be able to do virtual events has yeah, been, yeah, yeah. yeah, has been a way of bridging that gap too. But I mean, as you say, like you said before, you were a reader way before you were a writer, and the same with me. And now we are in a room full of readers, that's why you guys are here, unless it's for the free tea downstairs, but you know, you're welcome either way. Um, 
and yeah, it's that moment where you sit around and like, that's it. It's like, I read your book, like, you know, I don't get a cut. I love this book. And it was just great to be able to kind of like read something that was wonderful and kind of talk about it. Yeah, it's, for it's sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that, um, I don't know, I guess when something I've realized is that whenever the book gets into a new pair of hands, it takes on another life. Absolutely. Like it, it left me a long time ago. Yeah, like I can yeah, yeah, yeah. sit here and I can yeah. talk about it. I know what I was yeah. saying, but like everyone has come with something different and it's so wonderful for people to like you know when people reach out and they're like this is what it meant to me um that's yeah it's a really humbling feeling that you could make encourage someone to feel something yeah 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 absolutely and w so what's next like are you are you doing photography you're doing books what are you thinking um music as well my goodness <laughs> uh, I'm working. and you're young so you're really <laughs> annoying like all this stuff you've done it's amazing um, yeah I'm working on my next novel at the moment, which is about two young people, <laughs> um, two jazz musicians who have grown up together, and it follows them over the course of 10 years um, yeah. at five-year intervals, which I'm really excited about. Um, but I'm also writing for the screen at the moment, too, right. so I'm working on a TV show of my own. Of this, or something completely um, different? Of something different. This yeah. will be a TV show as well, though. Yeah. Um, and I'm working on a feature film, too. Oh, so keep him busy. Yeah. <laughs> have some kids. We'll slow you down. You have some kids. <laughs> give, give the rest of us a chance. I, I want my naps. I'm not going to work that hard. I need you to slow down. Um, that's amazing. So this, with this, this new book, there's, kind of, there's clearly some like, obvious commonality with this one. Mm -hmm. So are you looking to kind of respond to this or expand this or try to keep them completely separate kind of in a kind of understanding I, I had this conversation with my editor last year and <laughs> she was and I was like I'm really conscious of writing open water too um, what would like, be the subtitle of <laughs> yeah, open like, water too like, <laughs> the, the ocean like, yeah. um, and, and she said something to me which I haven't forgotten she was like you know you have you've written this book and you've started down a path and you don't really get to turn back. You, you know, you get to like go off on different tangents and different angles. But there's like something very specific that you are doing, and there will be something very specific yeah. that you're doing with the the next work. I think with open water is really intense. Like yeah. it's 140 pages. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's not very long, and it's like it's short and it's sharp, and it really like packs something. And like I wanted to hold on to that with the next book, but. I wanted to kind of expand yeah. the lens a little bit and not yeah. just look at these two central characters, but also look at the worlds around them and look at the communities. That Which we get a glimpse at at yeah. this one, so you kind of want to expand yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. And, um, yeah, so um, what was I going to say about that is uh, the, the kind of the stylistic choice of making it a kind of short, sharp story book was that I mean was that the intention what was the kind of reasoning behind that was it bigger and then you, sh you cut and cut and cut and cut exactly. or it was always going to be kind of like it was actually smaller before um, oh really before the, my editor was like you need a little bit more um that's, well it doesn't feel padded so that's good because <laughs> that, that's that's never a good sign <laughs> right. you're like yeah could you throw in could some dross just, just yeah. like throw that in there um, yeah. no like more I, car chases yeah just like a little <laughs> little action um yeah. I've always loved short novels um, just because of the precision and, yeah, and the yeah, tightness yeah, and yeah, what yeah, you yeah, really yeah. have to like work with, with within that short space and so I think I don't know my editor and I are currently tussling about it at the moment I think my, my novels will always be quite short yeah. um, but I think with with Open Water like I one of the things I said to my agent um, when we first when I first started writing was that I wanted it to feel like this like a really short album yeah, so it's yeah, kind of like thing that you could sit and read, yeah. start to finish, if yeah. you if you really yeah. had like wanted to and had that yeah. that sort of time. Um, yeah, and I hope it feels like that. Yeah, absolutely. And but th this next one, you want to kind of expand and kind of slow it down, like stylistically. Have you thought about how you're going to do that, or yeah. have you you're not gotten got that far? But I think I'm like I'm halfway through um, the draft at the moment, and it definitely because it's all three of these like sections are set in yeah, yeah, yeah. the summertime it has this sort of like languor to it it has this like slowness yeah, yeah, yeah. to it um but i also am so keen on on rhythm in in writing and yeah. like i want like i want things to sort of like 
I'll do like I want a slowness and then I want a bit of a pace and yeah, yeah, like yeah. I want the reader to kind of follow me along on, yeah, yeah. on this journey as as I have. Um, I think where so much of this book is actually very like present mm-hmm. and it's very like right now, like you know this this work starts in 2010 and ends in 2019, mm-hmm. um, but also goes backwards and and really explores these two musicians like the making of them essentially mm-hmm. like what, yeah, yeah, yeah. like who their parents were yeah, and how yeah, their yeah. parents came to be and yeah like I'm just I think I'm so interested in how like I've always been interested in the present but I'm so interested in how people come to be in the yeah. present yeah. and again I think that probably does come from having this big family of access to yeah. a lot of your history your family history and it's, yeah, yeah, sure. it's inevitable you know very clear where you're from because they're one cracking jokes at the end of the <laughs> yeah, table yeah exactly uh, yeah it's brilliant um so I thought maybe someone else might want to have, have some, some questions and ask. Uh, anyone? It's always kind of brilliant. It's kind of, a, I, like, I like that first hand. It makes it easier. Brilliant. So just wait until the, the mic comes. Oh my goodness, it's, it's on a pike. That's exciting. Hi, um, I haven't. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Haven't read it yet. I saw um, you on the on the program, so I really wanted to come along. Um, from what you've been saying, do you know Harry Kunzru, the writer? He he writes a series of fantastic novels. One set in India. He, I think he's half um, Pakistani, half uh, white British, and he writes these novels that. There's one about jazz, so that's what made me think of it. But but it just really gives you an amazing glimpse of in quite an intense way, again, to what you were saying, about a particular set of circumstances, somebody's particular life. And from what it sounds, you know, your book sounds very similar in that respect, which I really like, that sort of look into somebody's situation that you might not necessarily have thought of before, um, or, you know, and and what you were reading about the... um, the, um, um, the barbers, you know, just that that snapshot, and as you say, a short, punchy book. Um, I, it just it sounds, sounds great. I'm, you know, really looking forward to having a read. So uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it should be good. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, you said a lot about the present moments and what makes you your present moments so important for yourself. Um selfishly because like I'm here <laughs> like I'm looking at it like every I think for like everyone's I feel like everyone has like a has stories that they need to tell or deserve to be mm. told like it you know mine isn't necessarily any more special than yours but like there is a pull that I feel towards like documenting now towards being like coming towards the page and being like this is what I can see and hear and feel. Um, and many different people experience that pull in various ways, whether it's on the page or with a camera or like orally, like, yeah. you know, or even in like kind of like, I don't want to say smaller ways, but in a way that you might sit across from a ma- family member and describe what you did or like what happened yeah. today. Like oh. I think just now is so important. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I completely. I think it's such a human instinct to to want to be heard and to kind of like I was here at this moment because it's such a brief moment. And if you have, you know, the ability, you can do it in text or uh, you know photographs. But also just, yeah, it was, you know, in the back of a cab and kind of having that kind of conversation. I think that's still the same impulse of like, here I am. I experienced this. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's such an impulse. Yeah. I um, think also. Uh, like just thinking of this actually one of my friends who is a poet um kareem who's just like brilliant we met for dinner a few weeks ago and he he said of the novel he was like you know i didn't realize how important it was for me to feel like i'm being seen Mm. and i guess like a lot of my work both writing photography is affording space to people who might not necessarily be seen to be seen. Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. another right. that's another place where like that originates from. Do you, and, and do you feel kind of almost like a missionary sense of like these there's it, you're documenting these lives that would otherwise go unseen and un, un, or maybe even kind of seen but um, looked at mm-hmm. but not seen as it were. I think it's I think it's less you know it doesn't feel like a sort of like labor or anything like mm-hmm. that it um 
it feels like the way that I would that I show care to yeah, yeah, yeah. the world and the people that are around me. Like, yeah. you know, it's like here, here is some space. Mm. Like I think that's like something that's very simple but like incredibly powerful. Mm. I, I again I was kind of talking to another photographer and it was this idea of he would never deliberately um, show anyone in a bad light. So, you know, he takes these, he takes photographs during like protests and stuff like that. And he talked about this kind of um, care, ensuring that these people are represented. He wanted to document and show what happened, mm -hmm. but in such a way that everyone kind of maintained their dignity. And that sounds exactly something that seems important to you as yeah. well. And almost kind of like a moral duty. Yeah. Um, but I guess like to allow people to bring their whole self Mm. Like, whether that's, like, the beauty of them or the ugly, like, the messy parts. Mm. Like, you know, like, I like the fact that I have people around me in which I know I can fall apart in those spaces. Yeah. And I know I can also be my best self. Um, so, yeah. I which is kind of fascinating because it's so separate from this, the, from the narrator. And I said, he's a photographer. And, you know, a, similar, I wrote a book that have kind of very kind of tightly identified with me. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, it's kind of the question, but you kind of answered it, was that, you know, there is a real separation between these two characters. Mm -hmm. And he is almost, it's, it feels to me like if things had gone worse for you. That, it's a possibility. Yeah, that right? if you, you didn't have, as you say, these kind of places where you can fall apart safely. Mm -hmm. um, was that deliberate or was that, am I just reading into something? I uh, guess it's, I guess in writing, you know, I mentioned earlier about like building these events from, feeling yeah, like it's yeah, like yeah. you know these are feelings that I know but also the people around me yeah. and like on you know for someone who is young and black and is from South East London like yeah, there yeah. are so many things that happen in this book that could have happened yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that have happened yeah sure. yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah and so for me the int like the intrigue was to just explore what yeah. happens when you go down that road of possibility both in terms of like the loss of things but also the joy of things too. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Any more questions? Anyone have? No? We, we'll go ahead and, well then, I guess we'll stop there. Can we just give another round of applause to Caleb? Thank you. And it's a beautiful book. Thank you very much. You, yeah, that was brilliant. And thank you guys for coming out. It's lovely to see to see humans again that I'm not related to. <laughs> uh.